Hi all and back on saddle today on another chapter about the migration era. So today we're gonna discuss <coughs> essentially um, a, a pre-stage um, of the same migration era uh, as we call it proper, you know, um, it, it's obviously just an historiographical term to define this period in which um, it's usually associated with late antiquity and um, the <coughs> the movement of the peoples, um, you know, especially uh, in, in dwelling in beyond the, the borders of the Roman Empire. But telling the truth, as I um, um, already um, recalled in other videos about the migration era, really um, we have to think about a world, that uh, a nomadic world that existed substantially since, <coughs> you know, the, the very first human societies. Um, and that had a very strong nomadic character for literally for millennia um, in the Eurasian steppes from which the same Europeans uh, and um, uh, eventually came to you know eventually settle into Europe um, <coughs> and that uh, was an extremely powerful uh, you know civilization in many way uh, in many ways um, today and uh, I think it's beautiful to talk about the mi migration era exactly to stress the um, in this sense the, the very roots of uh, the, uh, the nomadic peoples that at a certain point um, came to settle within the borders of the Roman Empire uh, some of them had already been <coughs> sedentarized like the Germans uh, that eventually were once again put in motion and sort of were uh, re-nomadized in, in a certain way because of their uh, of their uh, lifestyle and necessities um, but um, there was also this huge group of other peoples inhabiting the Eurasian steppes that were by the way um, especially in the Indo-European branch quite quite close quite akin in, in relative terms to the um, the Western Euro the West Europeans and were essentially their, their cousins and 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 um, originally the same Westerners um, shared their lifestyle in Norseback and that's where th they came all the way from Caucasus to settle in, into Europe. So um, <coughs> the um, um, uh, these these peoples are kind of forgotten in our day. You know, we kind of think that our Western identity is mostly something created during the modern age, or perhaps during the Middle Ages, or perhaps by the Greek and Roman world. But if you really look at the, <coughs> you know, um, you know, scratching at, at uh, what was the, the original body of peoples that eventually originated those um, civilizations that eventually came to be like you know the Greek the Roman one the, the Celtic the Germanic all came from the steppes and were um, uh, continuously influenced even when they settled down became sedentary by them like the migration era mostly um, <coughs> you know shows but in this sense we shouldn't look at these nomads from the steppes as something you know barbaric and uh, you know uh, coming from the outside and being radically you know opposed to to sedentary civilization not at all it was basically the same um, genetic core of nomadism <coughs> having an, an another wave um, yet another wave into into the european continent has you know it had uh, happened for uh, even m millennia before, and the interesting thing is that these peoples largely uh, kept, um, um, you know, kind of uh, pretty homogeneous and uh, I can say re relatively unchanged um, culture, but um, let's say they retained certain characteristics, obviously related to nomadism <coughs> and all that it, it, it implied, but also, for instance, that we will be seeing that in a while. That kind of you know, ruled the steps for for millennia, from the top of their military culture, of their traditions, etc. Um, traditions, who incidentally, were also quite close to the ones of the Roman world. You know, there is this kind of crescent, uh, starting from from Western Europe, crossing the Eurasian steps and coming even to India, of Indo-European, um, uh, you know, <coughs> um, tradition beliefs, religious beliefs, there, there is a striking similarity between the um, uh, religions of, uh, of the Romans, of the, um, you know, of uh, the 
uh, the Vedic culture of the <coughs> Shitsian um, pantheon, etc., that uh, tell us that we basically came as uh, Westerners, uh, meant as Westerners from that core, from the same, from the sa all from the same cauldron, and that only eventually we differentiated into the various, you know, uh, branches that settled and largely became sedentary. <coughs> especially in the southern parts of the Eurasian uh, continent, that is essentially Europe and uh, mm, and um, Western Southern Europe and, and and India mostly, but also in 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 Iran. Uh, the Medians <coughs> that created the Achaemenid Empire, as well as the Parthians who created the the Parthian um, Empire, were kind of 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 um of southern Iranians. Uh that is uh, Iranian is a world that uh, really takes the name <coughs> from Iran, but it's not because these people actually came from Iran, but the other way around, because they went into Iran from the steppes. And these were all from the same stock of the uh, um, Iranian branch, that is essentially the, the eastern branch of the Europeans that uh, were so influential and still make up um, you know a lot of the tradition and culture of large areas of the Middle East that in this sense um, share sort of Aryan um, you know um, elements in common with, with with Western Europeans in many ways you say even from an ethical point of view but this is not really what I want to talk about maybe I will I will in another video for today I want to really talk about um, this Iranian route in the process of the uh, migration era, in the sense that I want to show how important these peoples like um, the Shitsans and the Sarmatians were important for essentially the, um, you know, the formation of our Western world in many ways, because they were always um, quite close to the sedentary um, populations of Europe and deeply influenced them even were mm, when they uh, obviously split and and they remained nomads while the others came to to form other forms of of society. So <coughs> we have to think it's mostly the history of Eastern Europe in many ways because uh, geographically speaking, in the sense that um, you know w m we're talking about an area that uh, basically encompasses today's. Uh, Romania, Moldavia, U in the Ukraine, you know, this area between <coughs> Transylvania and the Carpathians and the Black Sea, um, that between the 8th and the 3rd century BC uh, was invested by um, a great number of migration of people coming in, fra in fact from from um, Aryan uh, origin, um, from branches like the Shitsian and Celtic one, that basically came uh, from different directions in the sense that the Celts actually at that point migrated from Central Europe so they were moving east and not moving west like the Shitsins but we had differentiated a relatively short time before from the Proto-European mm, family as such and this area <coughs> is very important you know today we will be talking essentially about ancient history but um, uh, and this area of Eastern Europe is extremely important even dur d during the um, the Middle Ages because it kind of kept the um, you know its character of um, of, of, of a sort of um <coughs> very fluid land from from um, you know a human settlement point of view. There were a lot of n uh, nomadic influences that we can see you know from all the peoples of Turkic stock from the Huns, the Avars, the Bulgars, the Magyars that crossed at a certain point. These were peoples who normally would settle in the Hungarian plan because being uh, horse peoples, uh, horse riding peoples, they, 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 they needed fresh pastures for, for their horses that were the base of their own military and social, social mil political and social military system. Um, <coughs> and, um, you know, think about the Kumans, think about the uh, Pechenegs and uh, the same Mongols in a way, because even though these were of Mongolian stock, um, you know, and, and Eastern Europe is deeply influenced by, especially in the south, um, and of the steppes, um, of the Black Sea steppe, 
by these um, migrations. And it's interesting because, you know, th th there is a, uh, a great multi-ethnical character of this area that um, it's fascinating because it's also multicultural, so that you could find um <coughs> peoples who had relatively sanitarized in these areas that um, when new waves of nomads arrived, basically began once again to follow them and to, to become nomadic again. So you can imagine also... Uh, I love military history, so I think uh, the, u the use of uh, cavalry warfare and all the, the uh, technical you know, um, abilities that were kind of in injected once again into this area um, uh, for horse um, uh, riding and fighting. So, um, very, very interesting things. But in the ancient world, it was most it, it, it mostly um <coughs> got down to Shitsins and S and Celts, and also the so-called Thracian. Um, stock that um you know these were peoples uh were essentially semi nomadic peoples they weren't really fully nomadic um, ones especially the Celts and Thracians renownedly were more sedentary in many ways um they usually um had an economy based on cattle so especially uh horses and sheep um and all on on gathering so you know eating, you know, what the land could give without, essentially without um, plowing it, so without becoming, uh, you know, sanitaries and agriculturers. Uh, unless it wasn't, you know, <coughs> something really small in the sense that it's not that these peoples didn't, um, you know, didn't work the land because of some prejudice. Obviously there were some cultural resistance, but it was th in turn just uh, uh, you know, a consequence of the fact that they had always been living as nomads because the environment didn't support for the technology of the time and the nature uh, of the soil, um, you know, great cultivations like it could happen in, in, in Gaul, in, in Italy, etc. So um, it's kind of um, um, it's kind of interesting even to, to think about that, that, uh, you know, the, there is an environment that basically um, shapes the way you live in, in, in so deeply and by, you know, tracing so deep differences between between uh, populations that otherwise come from, you know, essentially the same origins in, in many ways. So the Greeks who were the first ones who began essentially to write about um, these peoples, if anything because they were quite close to them, living in the southern Balkans and the Thracians were right right above them uh, in the north. Um, um, and, uh, and, and also the Greeks had very intense uh, relations with the Black Sea coast of the north, so th they, they kind of were quite deeply in contact with these peoples. Um, <coughs> weren't weren't really aware that at that time of all the various uh, ethnical certifications of of, of those mm, peoples, in the sense that um, they kind of identified the, the the peoples that inhabited those lands, essentially of two essential ethnicities, the the Jedi and the Dacians. Um, and uh, and telling the truth. Um, it's very difficult, historically speaking, to even tell what the actual difference between these peoples was, because um, <coughs> the, um, the the, the so-called Jedi and Dacians are seemingly, um, you know, two very homogeneous, um, uh, a very homogeneous group in, in themselves, and this is also, methodically speaking, uh, a good mm, you know, moment to remember, you know, how we shouldn't really. Um, read these names as if, you know, <coughs> they were um, nations in the modern sense, you know. Um, we are rising in a world in which we, we are used to see um, political maps where, you know, th there are borders and uh, all these states, all each one with a different color, so very neatly shaped and unequivocal <coughs> identity and character, but first of all it's different even in, in practical terms today, but you have to think that that comes for essentially the, the concept of national state and the um, e even uh, the um, uh, enlightenment's need of class of uh, scientific classification. But when you read ancient and medieval sources, you can't really attach to certain ethnonyms uh, ethnonyms 
um, um, you know, a scientific value of characterizations, of characterization. Most of these peoples were even conceived in sort of mythological fashion by uh, the peoples of those times. Uh, yes, there was a lot of travel, there was a lot of interaction as always, but there weren't the civilization premises to really give a, a real precise character to, um, you know, these groups on, on the base of what the Greeks or the Romans called them. So that uh, some historians even came up saying, well, this is a very arbitrary definition, actually, um, these peoples didn't perhaps even exist as such, or better, they didn't even identify themselves through those names and through those group repetitions. Um, <coughs> so in, in the case of the Jedi and Dacians, we're talking about a huge, a literally huge territory in terms of uh, superficial extension that really stretched from the Danube River to the Vistula in the north, um, so to the Baltic Sea and up to the Dniester in uh, in in uh, in the Ukraine, so um, uh, it wasn't really, and it was a place that really didn't see a lot of penetration from merchants, of people, of military expeditions. In the sense that it was w such a, a poor land that obviously sustained <coughs> uh, a mostly nomadic uh, mm, society and. Uh, the Medi Mediterranean civilizations were not interested in, in that, in a sense. The Mediterranean civilizations expanded uh, into only in those areas in which their sedentary society could be su mm, supported. So there was no, not even great interest about those lands. So it's this very mm, actually big part of Central and, and Eastern Europe that, um, not surprisingly as a consequence, is is extremely foggy to us uh, at that time from a from a political point of view be and an ethnical point of view as well, because we really don't know aside from s very scanty um, informations given uh, to us by the Greeks and the Romans who inhabited there and where they came from. Um, but um, we can't say that um, they were pretty homogeneous in some fashion because first of all they spoke a language was pretty close to the Thracian one um, but they they seemingly had also very um, marked um, um, markedly shit in uh, character in their society and culture and lifestyle and this is what I, I was telling you before that is that there were similar peoples that um, However, living in, in different regions uh, kind of maybe maintained the same language, but they uh, they kind of began to live in different ways. This is typical, even the same Thracians. I, I made a, a, a video about Thracian warfare, and, and I was noticing how, in fact, the Thracians were closer, you know, from, from I on the in, uh, let's say they were on the right bank of the Danube, were much more sedentary than while living on, on the left because the latter were c much closer to the Shitsins and kind of had more cavalry, were more mobile, um, more more nomadic, while the the, uh, the southern ones were kind of more similar to the southern volcanic um, societies. So <coughs> this is how r it really happened. The important thing is to even to remember how, you know, it, it really unstable these mm, groups were, not just from a political point of view, but from an actual, you know, physical point of view, in the sense that they shifted, they 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 traveled, they migrated, they they fought among each other. So it was a lot of movement. Part of which was also caused by the fact of you know finding you know new pastures for for the horses, etc. So um, uh, at the same time, you find instead uh, a much greater group. Um, that is the one of the Shitsins. Um, so um, these were um, essentially of North Iranian origin, which simply means that they they lived in this area of the steppe, and not so much closer to the um, to southern Europe. And they they lived in a very great um, great um, space, which in turn also in, in here. <coughs> complicates really our understanding of the world because uh, they were more far from the Mediterranean civilization who wrote history 
and were also, you know, many. So they were much more difficult to trace as, you know, historically speaking and what they did and what their ethnical groups mm, were, etc. And however, we know relatively a lot about the Shitsians considering, you know, the times and spaces. Um, they were um, essentially um, excellent um, horse archers who practiced certain ceremonies of mm, shamanic character uh, that basically induced a state of excess through certain um, to certain um, 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 hallucinogenic um, uh, substances, probably the Indian cannabis that is today is known as ashish from the Arab uh, term, um, which um, is really, you know, the, the Greeks, the Greek historians by describing them kind of, you know, feared them because um, the Greeks became to, to of all the peoples that they knew, became became to to um, address the Shitsins as this very big uh, people that was the most barbarian of all from their per Greek perspective, in the sense that they were so different from the Greek city-states, sedentary with a political organization based on supposed the democracy, in at least in the etymological sense of the world, that, you know, these tribal peoples, nomad nomadic, um, you know, used to, you know, having kings and uh, having no settlement, no fixed settlement at least, were really kind of seeing the, the, op the world in reverse in many ways. So the stereotype of the barbarian, even in the Greek myths and Greek tragedies, etc., uh, is always present there to, to define the strangest, the weirdest kind of of society. But obviously, uh, that's just a subjective ja judgment in many ways. Um, so the the Jato Dacians uh, had kind of developed their own military techniques, um, <coughs> especially um, when when they were in contact with the um <coughs> nomadic groups of Sarmatic uh, stock just like uh, the Adziges uh, and the Roxolani that uh, at that time already existed um, but uh, you know we know them mostly be when they, they came to knock at the Roman gates at the point and therefore get mention and interaction with, with the Romans and, and are recorded in Roman history in part. Um, and the Shitsins were essentially for, for for a very long time so at least for the, the, the um, the first millennium before Christ, the the basically the the engine for all the migration that um, happened within the Eurasian continent. Um, as we were saying, they weren't uh, a single people, a compact people, but a very wide group of tribal, um, of, of warrior uh, and, and nomadic tribes <coughs> that had in common shared. Uh, substantially a language, religion, weapons, um, um, t um, mm, mm, horse breeding techniques, and especially, um, you know, the, uh, mm, the breeding techniques of uh, warrior horses, and especially uh, also a great mythological ability. They were um, seemingly extremely good um, uh, smiths and, um, and, and, and goldsmiths. Um, you know, uh, Shitsin jewelry is some of the most beautiful things, I think, in my opinion, that you can find in history of art. Um, and this came because, um, surprisingly, these steps people had actually a pretty advanced metallurgy. They, they kind of uh, disposed of the materials and the technologies, and, um, um, and this was very important even into, you know, for the development of the same Mediterranean weapons in many ways. I, I made a video about the origins of European cavalry, in which I talk, ex mm, you know, at least, yeah, I talk a bit about that. Um, but let's say that, uh, you know, these peoples had really some of the best weapons around, especially swords to whom they attributed a sort of, uh, uh, of magical, um, you know, a magical, magical powers. They kind of, 
um, felt this, the, those words had a spirit. There was a kind of an, an alter ego of the of the warrior who owned them. Um, <coughs> this is, you know, these peoples came during the migration era as auxiliaries largely into the Roman armies. Parts of the Arthurian legends actually stem seemingly from a, a bunch of Sarmatians who were sent uh, into Britain as a auxiliaries who carried out this cult of the sword. Um, that was usually, uh, you know, fixed on the um, um, Tom's mounds of the warriors, and it seems that Arthurian legends and you know the one of Excalibur and magic swords, etc., um, actually stem from 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 such influences during the migration era, which is extremely fascinating because it tells you that basically um, medieval knighthood was um, in cavalry were actually strongly influenced by his people's culture that was most a sort of feudal culture definitely a, a calorie man's ch um, calorie man culture it would put a lot of great emphasis on on the warrior his horse and his sword even the horses were obviously deities in the um <coughs> in the Shitsin world um they were thought to be s kind of the representation of life because they were a, a ketonic uh, um, animal because it, it was very strong, very uh, bodily, very sen um, you know bloody animal that reflected the the, the life of the heart that came mm, strongly from the underworld, from from this um, you know kind of terrestrial world. But at the same time, it could rise um, his own master, his own um, um, cavalry warrior to the heavens and when he died uh when a warrior died horses were buried um in the Shitsin world together with the um uh, wi with warrior and this was meant that basically the horse had reached the heavens so uh, together with the warrior where he could continue you know and, and you can find striking similarities with the germanic world with the valkyries um, you know, symbolisms, etc., because it was all part, in a way, of a greater European tradition that is present also in other traditions. Like, think about the Hellenic, the Greeks, um, Pegasus is also a ctonic, a ctonic um, a figure. You know, uh, horses were extremely important for for the Romans at a point, even if they had a few for the Gauls. It was kind of always this. Um, Mm, you know, uh, legacy that the common um, Aryan past had left, even in the uh, strongly senatorized Europeans of the old co in, the, uh, in, in, in Europe proper, um, and, and and kind of during migration era, it kind of was you know injected again into the uh, to the Europeans, and it strongly influenced the identities of. Uh, uh, of the same through this idea that the man was was uh, had to be the free man had to be a knight he had to fight uh, on on horseback with, with his sword etc so all the symbolism that really goes really beyond a simple political and social transformation of medieval Europe but had very deep roots back into millennia before Christ when uh, these peoples began to to expand into into Eurasia um, and um, in, in fact, you know, um, the, the Shitsins had these kind of uh, mounds that uh, were their tombs. The, the, the name is Kurgani. There is also a um, locality that incidentally was also a battlefield during World War II between Nazi Germans and Soviet Russians. Um, uh, that eventually is this very uh, important archaeological site where there, there are obviously burials of Shitsian uh, Shitsin warriors, etc. And um, and in these tombs you can find, in fact, um, jewelry, weapons, mm, equestrian finiments, and this is something you can find scattered all over, um, you know, the the wide area between Siberia and Caucasus, um, and even up to the Chinese Empire and Iran, because there were peoples uh, of Indo-Aryan uh, stock that really arrived, like the Tocharians. Um, who seemingly were quite akin to Western Europeans, who at a certain point migrated well into the um, um, Central Asian deserts, very close to si to China, and kind of interacted with the Chinese, and they even sold them um, their ho war horses, so that 
um, the heavy cavalry of the late uh, of, um, of the Han uh, Empire in China seemingly was of this breed um, purchased from the Tocharians. They, they were called the heavenly horses because, in fact, in Tocharian uh, religion, um, similarly to the Shitsim one, the, the, these horses were meant to be, you know, coming come from the skies, from from the deities of. Um, uh, the 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 overall underworld in many ways uh, were extremely prized, um, and the Chinese used them to fight other um, nomadic peoples of uh, Ugro uh, stock that were knocking at their uh, northern borders. So this tells you how you know the the Aryans were even civilization exporters to civilizations that were allegedly and well concretely more developed than them in many ways um, and how influential they, they really were so um, y you also have to think in this sense the sense of the continuous and very wide um, mobility and, 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 and journeys that these peoples made uh, across the Eurasian steppes um, and and how the their uh, civilization really lived through the millennia, substantially um, functioning well <laughs> for that environment, and uh, remaining um, the same in its uh, in its char main characteristics. So um, the um, the continuous um, motion of these peoples would obviously also cause problems to the sedentary groups um, because either it, it was them who were raiding and you know and hitting the sedentaries uh, or they pushed on other peoples that had to find a way um, to mm, you know somewhere else to leave and therefore uh, invaded other you know sedentary nations like the, the Chinese one you know they kind of uh, were um a bit of a <laughs> of a problem in many ways and th and the main problem was that their movements uh, couldn't be really controlled because they came from this very deep step where the the sedentaries didn't venture um um if not for trade sometimes but it was even something you know um it was a very dangerous place even to to go in um and therefore, the 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 Roman or Chinese Empire didn't actually know much about their movements. They they couldn't really foresee them. And part of the migration era and the same decline and collapse of the Roman Chinese empires uh, actually occurred because of the strategical, you know, um, question mark that these peoples represented in a sense. Where are they going to move? And especially where it's extremely fast. I, I mean the the times of um, you know of shifting fr uh, of shifting from um, uh, from from one side or the other of, of Eurasia was extremely fast. So um, I think one of the greatest um, the, the the mostly underestimated aspects of history is human mobility. And wh when you're talking about these nomadic peoples of the steppes, that's it's like kind of exponential <laughs> compared to uh, the ones of, of of the sanitary world who could move but didn't because <laughs> um, uh, you know they had find w they had found what to live in the place where they did and one of the reasons why you know uh, peoples like the Shitsims were so also so fierce and dangerous was exactly this continuous selection that was occurring to the steps for which it was a continuous clash for survival, so you had necessarily to be fit for war. Uh, these peoples had needed good leaders, good good warriors, and uh, and it was a kind of a world society set in those standards at that point. So that, from the sanitary perspective, that observed them um, was something you know monstrous in many ways barbaric in fact as they called it but um, you know that was really triggered by the, the, the bare necessities so the simple bare necessities yeah those ones would believe me in the steps were um, 
you know, were very important if you wanted to leave just, uh, just even for a bit. So um, the um, I, I I mentioned the Sarmatians. So mm, who were these guys? Were essentially were also part of the Iranian peoples, and they were also nomads. Uh, and probably more than the Shitsins, in the sense that the Shitsins had um, um, were kind of in 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 westernmost um, area of the steppes of the Eurasian steppes, because really the peoples inhabiting, like the Jeta, you know, the Asians inhabited the Carpathians, etc., where those aren't really steppes. It's basically where the steppes uh, finish with the Carpathians. So the Shitsins were the the westernmost step people and they had uh and they, were they inhabited there for, for a long time they had interacted with uh, the Achaemenid Achim empire um the persians of point sent even you know military expedition through trace into shitsia to to kind of um, um to defeat them to subdue them but it was a failure or at least you know it achieved a really few um um, but they were also close to these, to the Greeks, uh, eventually to the Romans, and to these sedentary civilizations that kind of brought in some sort of, you know, different influences uh, from the sedentary world. Not to mention that these peoples, when uh, had arrived, had even extended their own um, rule over sanitary groups that already existed in the area. So the shit since being so westernmost were already kind of, you know, mixed with more sanitary peoples. And, and, and the difference with the Sarmatians is striking, even especially um, from a military point of view, in the sense that the Sarmatians were these very heavy cavalry people, fully, um, you know, at least, you know, the, the, the heavy cavalry was always an elite. But can let's say that Sarmatians were kind of fully nomadic horse riding people. So the Shitsins were kind of so and so. Um the Sarmatians were more horse archers. The Shitsins had slowly become, even not giving up the uh, the archery, um kind of more of javelin throwers. Uh there is this difference. And it seems that being also very old people were were kind of Mm, was kind of weakening down. The Sarmatians instead came from the the, the mass of, of the central steppes, so they kind of were extremely cohesive uh, nationally, let's say, from a political and military point of view, and at a certain point invade um, the Shitsian lands and become to, to subdue the Shitsians, uh, up to basically absorbing them in turn. Um, and um, so even the Sarmatians, as we said, were extremely able to, um, in horse fighting, um, it seems that, and, and, and they kind of pushed so much westwards through, with their cavalry, um, to settle uh, even beyond the Shitsin territories proper, and fitting into that gap formed essentially by those gaps, plural, better, is essentially formed by the Roman Empire, when the Romans conquered Dacia, because if you see a map of Dacia, you essentially have this, you know, um, uh, kind of the uh, inner side of the Carpathians, that is this area that the Romans conquered, it was full of mines, and the Romans conquered it essentially for that reason. It was defendable because you have all the Carpathians around. Then west you have the um, Pannonian or Hungarian plain, um, and eastwards you have Mesia in this kind of mar marshy but flat area of the Danube um, estuary that goes towards uh, Shitsia and the Black Sea. So the, the Sarmatians, uh, at a certain point, after having knocked out the Shitsians, kind of fit into these gaps and become attacking the Roman uh, frontier. Uh, these, um, you know, th they, they clashed with uh, Trajan's army in the first century. Um, in the first century uh, AD, um, and um, and and they kind of you know b became the, the usual neighbor in the area. Obviously, were you know th these were also kind of mm, mm, detached tribes who began even to uh, to mix with other local populations that in that area were still already mostly sedentary at the time. Uh, and they had um, 
they had come and, sa and, 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 and their presence increased, especially during the 2nd century AD. Um, and, um, and the reason why they came so westwards were, we can't really mm, explain them mm, with certainty, or better, surely they, they came for two reasons, either because, or both, at the same time. So that's all we know, mostly. The first one is, obviously, they wanted to plunder and raid and subdue other peoples, etc., which they achieved to do with the Shitsins. The other reason was that they were being pushed by other um, peoples uh, from the Asian East. Uh, but the consequence is, is that, however, they arrived <laughs> into Europe, whatever the reason was, and they remained a kind of, uh, you know, of, of strong presence all over, you know, from the second century AD to far in time, at least until they fought. Um, and um, they... Um, the, the, they also had settled in a wide area, not just in Western Europe. So this area that is uh, substantially comprehended between the Don uh, River, the Azov Sea, and the Caucasus. So there were various branches, really. There were um, the main branches were the the Alans, the Roxolani, and the Yazidis. Even though even here we we don't clearly know through these names what we are really talking about. The strongest were the Alani, indeed, the Alans, um, and, um, um, the, um, and, and these were in fact the ones who even had the guts to, to, to clash with the Romans, because they were the first Sarmatian tribe that the Romans met. Um, and um, it seemingly the 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 Alans specifically um, came from this area of uh, today's I think it's Kazakhstan um, of around the Aral Lake. Um, so those were areas that were really deeply uh, you know were deep, the deep step in many ways were pretty re relatively far from any form of sedentarism, um, and and that's where these very tough mm, you know. Um, very very skilled um, people of, 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 of horse warriors uh, horse riding warriors were um, were coming from and at a point the um, I don't know if it was the Roxolani a tribe at this point kind of even invaded Caucasus um, in the south um, in today's region of Azerbaijan and and um, there was at the time I believe a Roman protectorate or at least an area that was disputed between um, the Romans and, and, and the Parthians, um, where usually the Romans had more influence. A and in fact, they tried to, to settle into Roman Cappadocia, so in the, in the, um, uh, in the heart of the um, um, Anatolian Plateau. And, and this is very interesting because it can make you even draw comparisons. You know, these plateaus, especially with pastors, etc., were obviously the, the first objective for, for for the nomads because those were the areas where they could settle with their horses and um, it's not surprised that uh, this area of central Anatolia would remain during Byzantine and even um, uh, Turkish times uh, even before the Ottomans proper um, um, a very important area to uh, train cavalry because um, you know, there are such uh, a, a great amount of lands in the Mediterranean where you can train very heavy cavalry, and and that was an uh, an important factor, you know, at the time. Um, and it's funny how you know uh, <laughs> the 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 Sarmatians not even having uh, even been there uh, in Cappadocia and Central Anatolia, they they knew they could move there, um, and other peoples in the future would move there, or at least certain. Uh, the Byzantines would train them their their cavalry, so um, it's interesting for its continuity. Incidentally, uh, uh, Cappadocia had been also um, the home of the uh, of the Celts, of the Gala the so-called Galatians, who had settled there. Maybe maybe a part of nomadism was also you know uh, nomadism was also one reason why the the, the Celts settled there being semi-nomad at that time. Um, 
but anyhow um, the the Roman historians um, essentially um, you know the, the Romans were deeply impressed by peoples like the Sarmatians um, let's say that the Greeks had known more Didshitsians while the Romans mm, the Sarmatians because the Shitsians were taken out when the Romans yeah had already conquered the Mediterranean but they weren't so you know deeply in contact with uh, you know, the Danubian area or the Black Sea. Um, um, so the Romans mostly described the Sarmatians, and and the Romans were quite sensible, especially to to their military might. I mean, um, they were extremely impressed by the uh, the, the warfare uh, of the Sarmatians. Uh, and especially by the uh, heavily arm, uh, armed uh, horses. Um, this is very important and, and this also links with what is I was talking about relatively to the origins of medieval cavalry, heavy cavalry in Europe, is that um, uh, peoples, uh, the peoples of the steppes were quite, um, um, quite ahead in the uh, working of metals and um and the Sarmatians seemingly and especially the islands had very um very um very good armor and weapons and they could um really uh, they had a very anatomical uh, for instance there is the so called um the mm, uh, the, the squamos is it possible or in Latin it's a squamata, it's essentially the idea of having uh, a scaly, uh, a scale armor uh, that basically adhered all over the, the body of the of the Alan warriors, at least of the elite that could afford it, but we were present in substantial numbers. You have to think that militarily speaking these peoples of the steppes had a, an elite made up of aristocracy that had a very heavy equipment and then a huge, um, a, a much larger quantity of, uh, of of uh, um, of lighter horse archers, sometimes without even armor, that were largely drawn from um, subjugated tribes. So um, they kind of had become rich on the tributes paid out by those tribes that also involved the participation to their military expeditions. And and obviously these elite shock um, uh, cavalry that was capable even of 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 um, it was both a shock cavalry means they charged and they could throw um, s um, arrows with their bows with their composite bows who had a, 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 a very considerable power um, was really a, a deadly mm, combination in open field especially um, and uh, and the Sarmatians were masters in these crafts and they especially knew extremely well how to work uh, iron, bronze, horn, ladder, uh, ladder. Um, and, and, and it seems also that they, uh, in order to charge, because these guys um, charged, really, they had very heavy uh, and long um, uh, spears that they took with both hands um, uh, while they were uh, riding, and, um, and they kind of charged um, with their cataphract horses into the enemies after having mm, worn uh, them out uh, with very thick and intense arrow fire. And usually the, the only side of this was enough not even to arrive to the actual mm, um, impact with the enemy formation which would flee uh, just to the side. But the problem is that they also charged with impact, so since these guys still didn't have um, stirrups, um, there is a lot of debate whether in military um, uh, history, whether, you know, how these guys could, you know, hit, um, uh, charge and, and hit um, by holding the uh, their spears called the contos. The contos was the, the Sarmatian spear, um, and, and, not, um, and not really... Um, um holding uh, the um uh, the reins of the horses so it seems that they were kind of um tied uh, very tightly with some kind of bells and bands and straps girds 
um, of any kind to kind of absorb the, the, the impact hit and, and obviously their horses were extremely well trained. Um, it's not surprised that the Tocharians called them the heavenly horses because these were a very particular breed of war horses that were extremely resistant. Well, the horse is delicate as an animal. It can be more or less resistant, but these were seemingly even quite big. Um, they had a very big size. Um, certain classical historians tell us that peoples like these southern Iranians had, like the Parthians had horses of size of, uh, of a small elephant, essentially, for how big they were. But th the most important thing is where it was that they were, first of all, extremely um, you know, into harmony with their own uh, riders, in the sense that uh, you, in order to, 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 to fight on horseback, you can't have um, a bad horseman and a good horse, or a good horseman or a bad horse. You have necessarily to have a good horse and a good horseman. And there has to be a bond between the two that can't really be um, broken. You know, you have to trust your horse in battle immediately and, and seemingly this breed was extremely well trained to even um, uh, respond to orders vocally I mean the, the or the not <laughs> the horses vocally responded it was the, the obviously the the cavalryman who just with a uh, you know with, with a with a uh, with a movement or or uh, or a cry would, would tell him what to do and uh, in this way, he could uh, he he was able not to hold the reins and to hold the 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 the, the spear with both hands, and managed to do this kind of uh, of performance. And plus information. I mean, ju not just alone, but these were in trained um, as single fires and as collatic fires at the same time. And it takes uh, an entire, literally an entire lifetime to, uh, and a continuous training to know how to fight in those formations. We're perfectly coordinated, um, required a huge a single a collective skill, and these were just formations. No people of the Mediterranean was able to do that. So even the Romans, who were masters of warfare of their time, were deeply impressed by these formations and um, if anything, because they fought against them, so they, they they saw what it was like. They had known the Parthians, but the Parthians were kind of more, um, uh, if you want, they, they, they were diluted in many, many ways already from the steppes culture, um, and they did there was they weren't really much of a of a threat after all. Um, the, the the peoples of, of you know the steppes were something tougher and the Romans understood that quite clearly and um, and the Romans themselves at a point decided to uh, kind of imitate uh, imitate the the this Armation warfare in some form so that th the Romans uh, who didn't have a feudal society to support heavy cavalry however kind of managed to replicate the um, uh, you know the equip the Sarmatian equipments to create sort sort of cataphracts on their own, um, who weren't to let me tell you very bright in the sense the Roman cataphracts, aside from the ones of the, the 11th century in the Comnenian um, age, which were which were something very different, however, from the one of the ancient world, were quite mediocre at, at the best. Really, um, the Romans really never made it to to. To made to have a functional heavy cavalry like the one of steps, and it was much easier to really enroll these guys as auxiliaries. So, uh, which would they would do because they they were paid and it was like a job like another. So, um, so this is how it happened and how maybe so much of Roman uh, cavalry um, culture uh, of the late antique era was influenced by these peoples. So, obviously, the need of even of countering them in a certain sense, because if these guys throw so many arrows at you and they flee, you need even to have heavier armor in a certain s in a certain way. Uh, you you need to have cavalry that can counter them in some way, or at least good good throwers, good archers of some form. So um, the 
um, there was a lot of clash between these peoples in many ways, but also a lot of you know um, meeting points. So both and and by the way, these the, these peoples of the steppes really have made a lot of mess also on the Persian borders, especially during the Sassanid age. You know, the Sassanids were basically the dynasty that uh, substituted the Arsacid one of the Parthian kingdom and kind of um, rebuilt even the Navier cavalry because probably they. They were influenced by the uh, the uh, the Sarmatians as well, um, and um, and and there was a kind of revival even in the Mediterranean world of these heavier cavalry, and especially the Sassanids could field uh, a pretty substantial and and and, um, and more effective one, and for uh, compared to the Romans, and for one very reason that the Sassanids had a feudal society. So they kind of had that form of society that that can sustain uh, a, and produce a heavy cavalry, essentially. And the Romans never had that. Um, the closer th that the, 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 the Europeans went to what was during the Macedonian age, uh, because Macedonia incidentally was uh, a feudal state in many ways, um, at least at the beginnings, um, and it, it, it not surprisingly had a very heavy cavalry uh, at that point. And it's not surprised that the worlds were clo so close to the Thracians and the Shitsians, so that they definitely had something in common and had maintained their um, uh, equestrian warfare stronger than other areas of Europe. But that was also because Macedonia could uh, and, and the social structure with Latifoni, etc., could sustain that form of lifestyle. Then eventually, even the Macedonians kind of. You know, they weren't really feu a feudal society uh, at the end. While the Sassanids were, and that's why the Sassanids had always very effective cavalry and cataphracts, while the Romans had, but they couldn't really achieve much with them at a point. And they had also in very contained numbers. So, uh, I got kind of the opportunity to talk a bit more about military history. Um, than usual, uh, something about <laughs> which I'm very happy because I would like to start at a point. But for now, I, I wanted just to make the point of how important peoples like the Iranian ones, like the Shitsins and the Sarmatians uh, were for for Western civilization and how uh, these roots really lay uh, within uh, the migration, e the causes of the migration era and, and of a br in a broader cultural influence um, that, that this brought to the West and not only indeed. So I hope you, you enjoyed this video. Um, as always if you did um, please sh um, you know please share it if you want <laughs> because and that's a way for me to get <laughs> to get quick views if anything. Otherwise just leave a like or subscribe if you want to receive a further notification because that's how it goes every time because if you subscribe every time um, I make a video, you get a notification. Can't that switch off? But it's a way just to say, you know, here it's a new video if you like it. Anyhow, um, as always, I thank you for listening and uh, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Okay, bye.